Welcome everyone. Um, thanks, yeah, thanks for coming. And um, I'm very happy to introduce this um, poetry reading and conversation, Poetics of Unlearning. Um, I'm, I think we're all in different time zones. So uh, <laughs> today or tonight, midday or evening or early evening, um, especially as the sun is coming out and some of us are exiting lockdowns and many of us suffer from a seemingly interminable Zoom fatigue. Um, <laughs> so my name is Roseanne Gash and um, I would like to introduce my colleague Philip Sattler as well and um, Mumtata Mehri, Young Mikim and Christina Chalmers who will read this evening. And I would like to welcome you all. And I will just hand over to Philip briefly to talk about the space. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome tonight, today, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are, uh, in whatever space and time uh, you join us tonight. We are actually meeting in a digital um, mirror of what um, is a rather new project and space that we are establishing continuously and have been doing so over the last uh, couple of months, which is called Annenstrasse 53. It's an exhibiting space um, that aims to establish, let's say, a clear division between a concept of exhibition as a representational form that is deeply rooted in colonialism, employing imperial modes of representation, uh, and contrasting with it with the concept of exhibiting that we pose as a continuous open-ended process characterized by the deliberate refusal of temporal and spatial closure and um, practices of closing and opening of um, artistic projects. As part of this exposure and flux, the space um, at this moment in time Frames works by Ariela Aisha Asule, Nina Kulovratnik, and the growing body of student work. And within this framework, we are welcoming today our guests and you to this um, event. Before we go into um, what this is all about, um, a few moments of housekeeping. We are recording this event, um, and eventually, uh, if all the speakers and readers of tonight Agree, we'll also publish um, this on our channels through, through Vimeo and maybe also YouTube. We ask everybody to mute themselves during the event and we will invite you to speak um, at the moment when we open the discussion and have a Q and A um, after uh, we have been listening uh, for a while. Please use the raised hand icon in the toolbar to make yourself noticeable and we will um, give you the stage. You have also the option to write in the chat um, if you prefer to write instead of uh, speaking and we can then read your questions during our conversation. Lastly, I would like to point out in which space we are meeting here today, the digital hyper-capitalist space of technology that provides us now with the ability to speak and listen to one another is, I would say, at the same time, a mechanism of censorship and suppression of resistance and open discourse. Zoom shut down a seminar at the San Francisco State University earlier this year over the participation of Palestinian activist Leila Khalid. It continued its crackdown and canceled several online events organized at other universities that did not include Khalid herself, but were critical of Zoom's censorship of her. Among them, the New York University, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. This is part of a growing number of similar incidents and events surrounding big tech companies around the world, prohibiting discussions around the complex relations of the settler colonial destruction of Palestine by the Israeli state. As an institution of art and architecture, we recognize that architecture and urban planning are both the means and the ends of Israeli settler colonialism and state terror. As educators, artists, and architects who come together, we must acknowledge that the tools of our professions 
have been co-opted to violate the legal rights of the Palestinian people. Over the last weeks, we have witnessed the destruction of massacre carried out in Gaza. We watched bombs collapse multi-story buildings, destroying the headquarters of news organizations, homes, and businesses. We've seen soldiers and settlers ethnically cleanse neighborhoods of Palestinian residents. We've seen cultural institutions tear gassed and raided, while libraries, schools, and hospitals have been burned and destroyed. Armed supremacist mobs lynched Palestinians on live television and destroyed Palestinian homes and businesses while protected by the police. Livelihoods have been shattered. What we can do now is not to be silent, not to be silenced and raise our voices in solidarity. I would like to hand it back to Roseanne to introduce tonight, today, this morning's event. <laughs> Thanks so much, Philip, and thanks for reminding us where we are. Um, so Poetics of Unlearning arose out of a seminar at the Institute for Contemporary Art, which is also where I am concretely, and in the Faculty of Architecture at Tate Graz. Um, and students, many of whom are here today, I'm very happy to say, um, have been working with me um, on a collaboratively written script or collage of writing that addresses in varying registers the ideologies of Europe and its border regimes, including where and when Europe is in a world system, as well as the experiences that are sedimented in us, in our bodies by these conditions. And um, I, I just wanted to also just kind of briefly introduce you to how this event came into being. So I invited Christina Chalmers to run a workshop with us. And um, from this process, we devised this kind of I, this or bringing this together so it's maybe unusual to have a poetry reading and conversation in an architecture faculty but I'm really happy that we can do this and I'm happy to kind of think about the architecture of poetry and the poetry of architecture as well perhaps um, in, as well as like the politics of unlearning in this sense um, so I hope that after these readings we can discuss further what tensions for example between um, the roughness and smoothness of learning and unlearning um, are produced, what tensions and, and limits are exposed at the levels of habit, pattern, model, language, and translation, or the untranslatable, or even loss and feeling through a poetics of unlearning. And can we, un can we actually unlearn the colonial capitalist conditions that preside in our institutions? Um, or how does a process of unlearning intersect with our opposition to these conditions? What is the scale of aquatics of unlearning? Where is its surface? What does it reach towards or gather around itself? Or, and uh, what shifts or ruptures might it produce? And I'll just brief, I will now introduce um, our guest. Myung Mi Kim it, uh, was born in Seoul, Korea. She immigrated with her family to the United States at the age of nine and was raised in the Midwest. Her collection of poems, Under Flag from 1991, won the Multicultural Publishers Exchange Award of Merit. Subsequent collections, including Civil Bound, which is really incredible, I've been reading it. Um, um, Civil Bound, from 2019, Penury, um, River Antis, Commons, Dura, and The Bounty, uh, her, so her collections. And an avant-garde poet who often employs fragmentary language and uses the white face of the page, Kim explores issues of dislocation, colonization, immigration, loss of her first language, and the fallout of history in her work. Um, and she is James H. McNulty Chair of English at the University of Buffalo State University of New York. Mumtasa Mehri is a poet and independent researcher. Her work has appeared in publications such as Jewish Current, Granta, Art Forum, The Guardian, Bomb Magazine, and The Poetry Review. She is the former Young People's Laureate for London and a columnist in residence at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art Open Space. Her latest pamphlet, Doing the Most with the Least, was published by Goldsmiths Press. 
and Christina Chalmers is a, doctor, is a poet and doctoral candidate in comparative literature at NYU, researching the relationship between um, the philosophy of history and the critique of the family in post-war Italy. She focuses on notions of inheritance, generation, reproduction and transmission. And she has produced a research film on critical distance and, disa and disaster preparedness called Exit Strategies. She has also um, published book chapters on experimental film and translated um, books on philosophy and psychoanalysis from Italian to English. Her published poetry includes work songs, willingness, and most recently, Truant of, a, of the Stintless Sun. Her forthcoming book, Subdeflect, will be published this summer, so I'm also really excited to see this. And also just to say that so we will hear from Christina first, and then Montata, and then we'll have a brief pause of about five minutes, and then we'll hear from Yomi Kim, and we'll open it up for conversation. So just to, we will we'll introduce this pause because um, I think the readings will be very dense, and sometimes it's necessary to just uh, recollect, uh, gather ourselves. So thank you, Christina. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm so uh, uh, honored also to, to be reading with such amazing poets. Um, I uh, wanted to begin um, by kind of reflecting a little bit on what learning means to me. Um, and uh, one of the one of the places that this, um, you know, where I started thinking about poetry was in a workshop with um, the, the late poet Sean Bonney, and he introduced me to this, um, this text, which is Writing the Truth, Five Difficulties by um, Bertolt Brecht. Um, so I'm going to read a bit of that and then move to my reading, which kind of reflects on similar things. Um, okay, so it's, writing the truth, five difficulties. It takes little courage to mutter a general complaint in a part of the world where complaining is still permitted about the wickedness of the world and the triumph of barbarism, or to cry boldly that the victory of the human spirit is assured. There are many who pretend that cannons are aimed at them when in reality they are the target merely of opera glasses. They shout their generalized demands to a world of friends and harmless persons. They insist upon a generalized justice for which they have never done anything. They ask, for generalized, they ask for generalized freedom and demand a share of the booty which they have long since enjoyed. They think that truth is only what sounds nice. If truth should prove to be something statistical, dry or factual, something difficult to find and requiring study, they do not recognize it as truth. It does not intoxicate them. They possess only the external demeanor of truth tellers. The trouble with them is they do not know the truth. Um, so uh, another um, thing I wanted to bring up from, from um, Bertolt Brecht also is his notion of crude thinking. So when I'm thinking about the idea of learning and unlearning, um, what immediately to me comes to mind is like, one, this kind of notion of what the truth is, how one can actually get at the truth. The other is um, my kind of resistance to, to um, certain kinds of, of learning or um, my idea of a dissolution of learning in like a notion of crude thinking. But um, I also recognize the kind of um, contradictions of this since um, in, in Brecht's uh, terms, uh, this, was, this is the terms he thinks of crude thinking as um, the most important thing is to learn to think crudely, he says. Then he also says crude thinking is the thinking of great men. Um, okay, so I'm. These are just things to kind of like start out my um, my reading, and um, I'm going to read now a poem called "The Telegraphy of Morning" um, with an epigraph from Joe Corey. Eat more fruit, the slogans say, more fish, more beef, more bread. But I'm on unemployment pay, my third year now, and wed. And so I wonder when I'll see the slogan when I pass, the only one that would suit me, eat more bloody grass. Um, okay, that's the Africa. As if within me, a voice rises up composed of spikes, spines receding into the dust. 
where terrible longing recedes, armor deserts companionability. That's too far to be too far for me. Losing command is confused as intimates, the voice of the dead ones, the one returning sibilance. I would command your reversible compartmented sound, making you into armor, pitiless politesse to become the trill of feck feckless negation, subtlety, nuance, of candor, pieces of resentment in the resistant dust, pièce de résistance, to eat more poems fully where nothing is as toxic as distance. In autodidactical, aureole, wholly foundered lostness, you will need to avoid all drugs, bottles of whiskey in the morning as the dawn rises, save your pennies, turn your life out, life out and leave home at 15. And so my terminal astrophysicist becoming the geometry of death, my father told me, my ma told me, inchoate masculinely, the mother of the cosmos, blithe and canny, not man nor woman, I am containment in this armored vehicular I hate. If as burning polytest confess, the dead are unreturned and returning to my forests of endless grass. Okay, so uh, second poem, and I could say a little bit about this. I mean, one of the things I'm kind of also reflecting on is um, my relationship to uh, mourning um, in terms of a relationship to, to kind of like learning um, and specifically thinking of the death of my father um, a few years ago uh, and um, all the kind of like associations with, with learning this brings up. Um, uh, uh, as someone who kind of um, had a, a really strong emphasis on autodidacticism and the kind of real resistance to um, institutional uh, learning. Um, okay, so um, second poem I'm gonna read is called Apical Thrill. This is a recent poem. And then I'll read maybe two more poems after that. An abandoned litter deche an abandoned swimming pool in the Viennese twilight, Mondrian concedes. The nation stay angular as my path comes to the window as I would draw pools recedingly. A film upon the lawn, the electricity department solicits me with cards and the Vespa, my fantasia. Each is spiritual sucker doesn't easily come by being so bound to your poverty. Wonders for conspiracy in the rained upon grass, mourning in a third figure, indistinct now among the wood chips and the falsified pearling contract. This alienness would buffer what I want from life, allowing the never having it. Truant of craven mutuality, I keep breaches within my meals and wither accordingly with your aggression where sumptuously I'm a foreigner split into pockets of my mind. With heart's hate withered to a simil similar time as each deceiving chemical empirical comes to the straits of shame. Plaything, gold rush of goldfinch I flinch from, frolic unlikely unfold, bustling in a death come old. Of anadonic blues, Dreams drawn down, protecting is preserving me, and latency would be the law, age calls slowness. Ataraxia flickered like it was bust, a recycled fairy tale, if green and in flame, so care form of fire suddenly dies. Destroy time, you say, slower than the last risky exit from the room. My clothes are not a florid mistake, and when I put them on, it means I will take them off again. Destroy time. Me of the beekeeper, sovereign ornithologist, spites charisma and talisman of another person contends who will underwrite your scrupulous wake. In order, to, in order to save me from death, you would have to be from the future, two sides of ink and the future. Structure is in the criminal, protective allumet, comes before smoke billowing low. The missing person burning and robbed. I'm bored, Robert, I want to talk with you. Flame on dominoes of broken lipstick, the oracular broken clip eddied to silver rays. I to disperse miss you as you vacuum me free of foreseeing. Um, uh, so, okay, I'm gonna read one that's called A Repetition of Everyone I Love and then one last poem and I will finish up. Um, a repetition of everyone I love. 
The world is indigestible in collusion, fills its belly with green foods to feed the grief till great Kratom's high life. On a loom to ship life back to you, deliver in love boxes of punched, happy, puncturing heat seat of soul that humor tases and amortizes the grief puckering at. Took LSD and saw blue spirits with you that yellower should be. Nothing will bring back vengeance like its own patrician. All shadows clamber into a calm and cr criminal subtleness that I pee into, savoring its fireish sand body. So all bellies are full and nauseatingly greeting, touching buttons and impurely eating. I'm calm, calmer than crumble are coming right into the past and putty that calm. Meteorol meteorological dust came up the mouth crux to just to burn caustic. Blue light of the cambric to soothsay fall by down. I'm phlegm so soft and came right now. Calomel, sob, Nemer the wee one, great Nemer the wee ones, chloride, mire, and sip sir on the meat meal in the call time not had. I can't eat, I can't eat. Cali mirror, we mirrors cling on the mirror for intermirror purrs. The father of mirror is cream, and me, me mumbles, I came too, and creamily sick, I cream. The stolen criminal boots up and drugs the clot. I read this in a humongous book I stole from your room, green cover. Access made by cribbing hunger. I love all things all asunder in the wit or hit call of the bolt that lightning split into immortality. Like Jack Smith's lazy brother, I eat pens and chagrin. The threshold of sex robs my name in robing salt in a bath of crass piss, grass like music with cum and weed stuck to my hair. Engrossed by robes like social disguise, rubbing body brook, grossest sickening brat, brotherly lover bobbing down the river in a garment of overalls. After Robert Burns and then we sever, green be your woods in golden hour clot in the green burke by the sunshot locked in brace for saving grace like greens the sod for pithy waters, slightly tattered, hungry daughters, hurting, sparkling and moldering now, totter down in my jaw. Like hollowing nauseous, I just don't know it's, if it's okay to have sex like this. I horror wishing everything dead, break my body in two and rub upon. And I heart hearts hurt under key of missing Robert, splint splintering the knife in wound like Saint Sebastian. The weapon of a baby's mouth is opening, moving hearts into velocity. Everything would sunder, persevering by the hurt half measure. Half the time between parents' death and your own before I'll see you again. There's never just alternating doom and miracles to travel, hereditary mortality, which the God crushes on your saddle. And um, I'm just gonna read one last one, um, slightly shorter. Uh, this one is called Revolutionary Love. Um, <laughs> okay, so banking on the future, the revolutionary trust puts hands on disaster, a point of contact where the seamlessness is made. Revolutionary love is a court of disaster. Not wanting to write like evasion, like a belief you do not share. Belief in love and the possibility of love as the opposite of loneliness. Belief in revolution and the possibility of revolution as the opposite of separation. Poetry plays its game in the fearful morning, asking for relation, but putting feeling in the coffers. The name is of a worker, pluralized or one, an alien friend. Speaking unburiedly, the time is now, unbearable present. Name is of a use of the, bod use of the body in a caravan of its own nauseous spirit, put food in all the mouths to feed them for the next day. The heart is empty, the miner's black lung, deoxygen deoxygenated with carcinogen and nothing mediates, meditates on this, another one. And anyway, revolutionary heroes in hostage are workers, a delicate friend on fire, flaming up with concatenation spirals in the water inextinguishably, point of contact where the hunger for love is gone. Bobby Sands is in the court seeking arms. Tele telepathy is the wire to absent comrades, Te telegrams in the newspaper column inch actuality up its wall. No desires for conversion, no voice stepping outwards. Revolutionary love is a court of disaster. Um, okay, so that's uh, the end of the poems that I'm going to read. Um, and yeah, I hope we we have time to like discuss some of the things that might come up um, from the, <laughs> the various uh, different parts that I put together. Um, thank you so much for listening. 
and thank you um, also for inviting me, Lizanne. Um, Welcome. Um, thank you, Christina. Um, Montaza. Thanks, Roseanne, uh, for inviting me. And um, thank you to everyone joining uh, tonight, um, joining us and sharing these poems and the discussion afterwards. Um, I'm just going to read a piece that I actually I wrote um, today. Uh, so that's a bit of a disclaimer. Um, just really a reflection and maybe, you know, if I'm being optimistic and provocation on um, my own thoughts around unlearning, which have been uh, shifting and uh, quite transitory in nature. But this is where they've landed for now. Um, it's a piece called uh, Ruined Finally. I would like to learn to live finally. One of Derrida's many prayers and specters of Marx, the state of the debt, the work of mourning, which was also the given title to his final interview with journalist Jean Bambon of Le Monde, a good place to begin. The inventory of a life heaves with a tumult of reinvention, this daily thrum of changeability. Like the admin, the Ute Dem caught this rebranding, a relinquishing of the past self and its pesky detritus, its granular and maddeningly human hypocrisies. It is impossible to rebrand what should never have been made a brand. This should be a given, but often isn't. The spirit is marked with the eventuality of its mercurial flagrance. In this, there are infinite opportunities to right wrongs without being discouraged by the fear of occasionally and frequently being wrong. I have been unlearning for as long as I have been learning. The theorists scrape against the edges of elastic definitions, stretching them like sticks of pink unyielding gum. Refusal, fugitivity, errantry, unknowability, Often I do not recognize any of these words or any of the refuseniks I have ever known or loved in their tones. I do not recognize those who have made an art out of evasion, out of skirting and sidestepping the abyss of transparency. Those who do not answer to their government names, whose real birth dates contradict what adorns their identity cards. Those whose cosmologies are hard won and bloodily held onto. Those paid under the table and threatened over it those who made a way out of no way, shunning the burden of recognition for the incomplete freedoms they clasp at every chance. I do not valorize the pain of such eligibility, but I will admit to being raised with the possibilities it presented with its ambient creativity. Another lesson, learning what you can to survive, learning what you cannot survive. The distinction is sufficiently murky like the river waters of old world Europe's rivers and its cities. With each generation, we clarify the parameters and limitations of this knowledge. From elders and societal edifices, we learn, then unlearn, then learn again. First is the agitation of ambivalence, the prickly skin distaste for routine inconsistencies of mind and soul. Then there is the brazen rejection of myths, grand narratives, ideological inheritances, empty apologies, easy answers, varying forms of intellectual and spiritual atrophy, and the very deadening of our natural critical impulses. This is a euphoric high. We have stepped off the tedious carousel. Yay, we are so much better than where and who we came from. Many indulge in the arrogance of these recent victories, wearing their wounds with a celebratory finality. But uncertainty is never too far behind unlearning. It stalks, persistently licking against our newfangled armored skins. Who no go, no, no. We have traveled far and have shed so much, yet much remains fossilized. Are we ready to be proven wrong again and again? Can we collectively embrace a fluidity of tactics and technologies? Unlearning should not lead to a dead end of lofty unilateral allegiance. We turn to and end up worshipping at other sanctified altars. Just because it feels good doesn't mean it isn't a trap. I don't mean we should self-flagellate endlessly. I mean, we've all been reading that same dog-eared edition of Bell Hooks' All About Love, and we're no closer to being less viciously transactional in how we treat each other. So something ain't clicking. Theory cannot save us from ourselves. Theory is elucidation of abstractions, which bears the same intimate violence as gifting someone you've just met with a nickname. To theorize is to bleach, to blunder, to isolate and render immobile what is always moving, 
always disintegrating and reassembling just out of view. The theorist seeks to map the dislocated, to pin the undefinable, to assess the illegible, dangerously close, too effectively and materially entangled with her subject, subjects or subjecthood. This ensures a life of teetering compulsion and split selves. Ego imperils the communal necessity of unlearning. Alienation has its seductions too. It doesn't always resemble a barren wasteland of relation. Sometimes it's gorgeously wrapped with the bows of dream jobs, professional connections, incessant ladder climbing, status consolidation, prizes, 40 under 40 lists, hefty endowments and other material embellishments. I am working against this work so that I may learn better what I am working for. Ultimately, like Derrida at the ripe age of 74, I want to learn how to live. I know refusal is a slippery negotiation of desire. When you say no, what are you saying yes to? The exhausting pleasures of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, the looping less trodden paths. We find our possibilities amidst thickets, thorny brambles and the lattice work of natural longings. Yesterday, we went for a walk and it was another act of renewal. I watched the Mediterranean Sea lap against the coast, the boats resisting its tide, and it was a different kind of knowledge. I am laboring under the weight of how much I will never know. This is experienced as a dull pressure against the ribs, the needling reminder of a thumb pressed against the nape of the neck. It is sickly sweet, but vital. Ignorance has a miasmic distribution, but unlearning too is feverish. It catches, alights, and creates new affiliations. I think of the long processions of my own unfinished journey, the late night debates turned arguments, endless phone calls facilitated by calling cards, friendships sparked in study and reading groups, the branching out of care networks, the digital contraband of drives filled with books, papers and films we could not afford to buy, the organic flowering of alternatives, the back of the bus interjections and the reconciliation of inherited dissonances at the feet of those who willingly or unwillingly pass them on to you. Unraveling should expand the circle, not limit it. What to keep, what to abandon. If unlearning is an exercise in abandon, it is also a willing abdication of what an unjust world offers for something else. Here I turn to Glissant in Treatise on the Whole World. If we abandon systematic thoughts, it is because we have realized that they have imposed here and there an absolute of being, which was profundity, magnificence and limitation. So many communities under threat today, he wrote, have only the alternatives of, on the one hand, the tearing apart of their being, identitarian anarchy, war between nations and dogmas, and on the other, a Roman peace imposed by force, an empty neutrality imposed on everything by all powerful, totalitarian, well-meaning empire. Are we reduced to these impossible choices? Do we not have the right and the means to live another dimension of humanity, he asked. These questions ripple the still lake of a history which refuses to end. Abandon has a lightheaded clarity. It is a register under threat, subjected to punitive and disciplinary measures. It is only when we abandon the places allotted to us under regimes of extractive power and order do we realize how much they rely on our cooperation, selective incorporation, and the decapitated pruning of our unruly edges. Abandon is willing, self-loving, abscondence, to learn from the flight of swarming honeybees from nests. It is difficult, but easier in communion. With friends and fellow travelers, it can even be joyous. We have to learn to love ourselves more than we love the institutionality of being. This is a love which may be experienced as a kind of ruin, a series of small but frighteningly implosive deaths. Death blows to the ego, to petty internecine beefs, imaginative traps, stolid fealties, death blows to comfortable dogmas, assumptive logics, the orthodoxies of counter logics, murderous global orders, mundane cruelties, savior impulses, and life-denying contradictions. Death to the cocoon self, death to the unbearable, irreconcilable. Derrida, again, always. Ruin is not a negative thing. First, it is obviously not a thing. One could write a short treatise on the love of ruins. What else is there to love anyway? One cannot love a monument, a work of architecture, an institution as such, except in an experience itself precarious in its fragility. It has not always been there. It will not always be there. It is finite.
Imagine what it would feel like to play in the ruins. Like the poets, the satirists depict the immediacy of such possibilities. In our fear of unlearning as ruinous abandon, what are we holding on to? I know my own personal response to this question, and I suspect the same of anyone listening to this. Our desires are as idiosyncratic as the amalgamations of unfreedom, as our varying distances from power's flattening orbit. We blister with the same desire for different things. I am forgiving of your inconsistencies because I am aware of my own. I too hunger for the trappings of the value systems which immiserate my own. In the words of June Jordan, what nation, what people, what stretch of my own personal history is good without blemish, without blame, without crimes of inertia, at least. To unlearn is to act and interact with forgiveness. Our struggles within ourselves against the enticements of the sovereign nefs or insatiable self will be continuous. They will be as difficult as our struggles against global webs of imperial capitalistic domination. Ancestor poets such as Kamau Brathwaite taught us so. From one notable poem, it is not, it is not enough. It is not enough to be free of the red, white, and blue, of the drag, of the dragon. It is not, it is not, it is not enough. It is not enough to be free of the whips, principalities, and powers. Where is your kingdom of the word? This kingdom can be found in a playground's chorus. Play interrupts a catastrophe of singularity. It undermines without pomp taking refuge in the delights of derision. I want to laugh at the things I should be sure about. I want to model the waters. In playfulness, while traveling and loving perception, philosopher Maria Lugones honored play and its ability to give meaning to our activity, including uncertainty. But in this case, the uncertainty is an openness to surprise. This is a particular metaphysical attitude, she wrote, that does not expect the world to be neatly packaged Really, rules may fail to explain what we are doing. We are not self-important. We are not fixed in particular constructions of ourselves. We are there creatively, we are not passive. Self-construction elaborates the ruin of unlearning. It is a risky process which requires the open, airy expanses of good faith and encourage vulnerability. What new people await us amidst the ashes? Beyond hackneyed cliches of rebirth, there remains a promise of a repaired relationship with knowledge itself. We may come to understand it as a tool not to be accumulated, hoarded, guarded, defended, privatized, wielded and enshrined. In our unlearning hands, it may be surrendered into something supple, into something that shudders with liberatory potential. Call me naive, but I truly believe that such a relationship to learning, to knowledge itself, would boundlessly transform how we relate to each other as well as our models of societal and political organization. The arenas for such transformations are countless, namely amongst them, group chats, shisha spots, salons, barbershops, stoops, balconies, park benches, Western Union branches, cafes with plastic chairs, always the plastic chairs, schoolyards, and the laps of elders. There are more, I am sure. I look forward to discovering them. I will end with this passage from Edward Dantecat's short story collection, Crick Crack, which attests to the slow disentangling, buttered act of writing, a task which I consider to be inseparable from unlearning. When you write, it's like braiding your hair, taking a handful of coarse, unruly strands and attempting to bring them unity. Your fingers have still not perfected the task. Some of the braids are long, others are short, some are thick, others are thin. Some are heavy, others are light. Like the diverse women of your family, those whose fables and metaphors, whose similes and soliloquies, whose diction and je ne sais quoi daily slip into your survival soup by way of their fingers. So I will just end with one poem of mine uh, that speaks to Dante Cat's passage. It's called, The Unthought Has a Comb. Friday night communion looks like washing your hair as the water swallows your people. Do it anyway. Two picks at hand manufactured in Nigeria, the teeth a fan ro fine row of discipline. Remind me, it hurts, it should. Olive oil to drip down the elbows, the good stuff, poured how you were taught, silicon down the pauses, sheer spit mix for the baby hairs, 
set the helical right down to the lid. Mama gave you a head of hair to write about, the kind that's the second passport. We all nurse our blessings. You turn on the new stream, watch a newborn dangle between his mother's legs, sinking like a stone. The sea, his first taste of salt. A woman splits herself apart, an ankle in each time zone, a meaning in none. There is no us, you, untangling from inside an island, the child of rolled dice and fluke, collapsing into a guilt made for your own pleasure. Claim nothing more than each knuckle's crack, the Lord's work in each braid, pull to the quick, loop a finger in coil and split the shore in half, bring back those who left, they line the dressing table, balanced on its lip and floating, prick the grease sculp awake, takes a good hour, sometimes more, to set the waves in motion. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um, this was incredible. Um, so the plan was to have like a very brief pause. Um, do, just, I just wanted to check is this, yeah, this is still a, a good idea. So we just pause for, let's say until um, 6.50 and then um, we'll come back with Myung and Kim. So um, just in case anyone needs a drink of water or anything. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you. So please stay here <laughs> or we'll get a glass of water.
Um, okay. Um, Young, I give you the floor, please. Or the screen. Welcome. Thank you. I have expressed very decidedly that the idea that the Indian should be taught in the English language only. There's not an Indian pupil whose tuition is paid by the United States government who is permitted to study any other language than our own vernacular, the language of the greatest, most powerful and enterprising nationalities under the sun. The English language as taught in America is good enough for all her people of all races. 1879. All newcomers should learn our language. They should learn about our values and they should learn to accept the way we live, accept our norms and values. 2016. America's ability to dominate some of the most inhospitable terrain for human habitation on the face of the earth. Panama Canal construction, 1905. Globally, linguistic diversity declined 20% over the period 1970 to 2005. The diversity of the world's indigenous languages declined 21%. Regionally, indigenous linguistic diversity declined over 60% in the Americas, 30% in the Pacific, including Australia, and almost 20% in Africa. The first impression is the unlimited audacity of man in ripping open the mountains, draining marshes and lakes, penetrating the jungles and impounding rushing rivers in an effort to throw two great oceans together. It is the greatest assault ever made upon nature the white man brushing aside all obstacles and scorning danger will have finished this greatest of all monuments of marching civilization. Nineteen thirteen. Students were led to a room where angled names were written on the blackboard and were told to choose a name from the blackboard. Students did so without knowing the meaning or pronunciation of any of the names. Each student had to respond Indian or no Indian at evening roll call to declare whether they had spoken in their native Indian language that day. What's the, the connection between seeing, hearing, listening, perceiving? So one of the things that uh, I wanted to um, start with is trying to think about poetics of unlearning, not simply as a kind of um, nomination, a naming of poetics of unlearning, but rather if we think of it as praxis of unlearning. What's the difference? And for me, this is like, I, I, I hope you'll bear with me because this is like a, an incredibly wonderful demonstration of what happens when we're uh, in some sense uh, unmoored from our conventions or expectations of what connection looks like. 
Like if I can't see you, what happens? It suddenly becomes like, I was very embarrassed. I was very like, oh my God, I have a problem. Rather than how can we convert what appears to be a problem as a kind of opening or a portal or an aperture for a new mode of understanding or a new mode of inquiry. So how can I tolerate my own discomfort in a way that helps me in some sense endure the kind of automatic negative a kind of transparency or ease of communication, right? That there's a kind of automatic intelligibility that we expect, whether it's through technologies. And in my case, really about the expectations of like intelligibility and sense-making upon a kind of socially contracted idea of what language is and does. So the reason I wanted to put in some kind of proximity, not only poetics, but praxis, so that I think this unlearning happens by doing, right? It happens by almost bit by bit, syllable by syllable, line by line, word by word, sound by sound, right? Negotiating what it means to listen, what it means to sort of unshackle oneself from what I'm calling these expectations of sense-making and intelligibility, right? Um, I will start reading in a few minutes, um, but I also wanted to make some broad um, overtures about how to think about a poetics of uh, unlearning in relation to other fields, other disciplines, ways to think about broad issues of what uh, unlearning across disciplines, across fields, across um, discourses might entail. But from my uh, work as a poet and a language thinker and maker, um, I think what the praxis of unlearning might do again across fields, disciplines, uh, discourses. Um, here I'm thinking about the following implications. How to conceive and theorize language that doesn't replicate the kind of imperialist grammars that are embedded in what I call big language. And especially in my case, because I happen to be writing in English, the implications of big English, okay? With all the kind of uh, capitalist, uh, militarist, uh, industrial complexes that are embedded in language as a kind of primary agent that not only allows us obviously to, to communicate, right? Um, but also where language and language acquisition and the kind of imperialist uh, overlay on how a uh, language becomes um, this kind of sole proprietary uh, spot for uh, who authorizes who speaks, for example, or who has the authority to say you make sense. Um, so in some sense, one of the like, tributaries here is how, how does a, a poetics of unlearning or a praxis of unlearning uh, kick up and interrogate the, um, or critique the ideology of monolingualism and all the kind of imperialist and colonialist uh, implications of that. Um, I'm interested in thinking about sense-making as like grammatical syntactical motions that we're all indoctrinated into, right? There, there's a kind of regimentation and standardization that is part of language making and language acquisition. Again, as Roland Barthes beautifully suggests in one passage in the neutral, uh, you know, language is like the driving instructions for the citizen. Like without it, we'd be like, what, you know, bumper cars all the time. However, I would like to submit that there is a kind of register of regimentation, standardization, normatization that we're all submitted to as, as you know, users of language. And this is where I think a poetics um, that understands this uh, potential to regiment how we think, 
how we feel, how we belong to one another. Um, and what it means for me is unlearning is not done once and for all. This is the same with resistance. Right? It's not done once and for all. It's not like you cross some divide and suddenly, you know, there you are on the other side. What I mean by praxis is to um, really posit that it's a way of working all the time. It's a kind of labor. It's a kind of commitment that one undertakes, right? Um, individually, and hopefully what we're talking about this today is how this happens collectively. Um, I'm also interested in what becomes more heterogeneous rather than, um, again, repeats a kind of hegemonic idea of what language is, what form is. I'm very interested in talking to you, those of you who are doing this uh, coursework uh, as part of this kind of art slash architecture. So the form uh, for me as a uh, practicing poet is like the seat of where this practice and question about in, in interrogating um, and, and being open to praxis comes from in my questions about how form arises, right? right. That's not already a kind of preordained or, or, or pre-existing uh, idea. So I, I would love to talk about um, those of you who are working more slash in that architectural context, how form arises, uh, what it, how you would pay attention to it, if it's not already, right, a given. Um, So let me, let me now segue. I mean, I have more to say, but we can talk about it together. Um, the the uh, material that I uh, read before I thought I was not there with you <laughs> uh, were, were uh, notes from my research toward my new book uh, that uh, Roseanne held up a little bit earlier. So those are just excerpts from my various uh, research um, uh, notebooks that I wanted to share with you to, in some sense, frame the reading I'll do today uh, from Civil Bound. Okay, I'll keep it short so we can open it up. And I really thank you, uh, those of you who stayed, for tolerating with what seemed a mishap, but I think could be very fruitful to talk about. Okay. Arches, vermilion, platform of movable objects for live spectacle, arch of armaments and charts, stronghold, prowess, a link of people sorted, size, strength, age. Bellflower broth, liver broth, hemispheric lust. Not in the codices or chance. Charity kin, hair and lime burrowed. Well placed towers, thrown down the wells scoured off the foundation. Boulders, mechanical parts or persons pledged to asunder. Humble rules for eyes and fingers, errant convalescence by arms and legs fettered, by the wallets of tongues, taught to make coffins for each other. In the museum of public actions, in the tone of guides, sacred places, Fence around the burial site, the leaf blower. It is conceded 
than an interoceanic canal through any of the isthmus passes of the Western Hemisphere is a necessity for the present and prospective commerce of the world. Scolding wings removed, cuts flushed, choke canal, abuts agricultural sunken medical, one pair gloves, three yards calico, whiskey, crackers, watch guard, one deck cards. The Settlers' Leisure, Fort Union, New Mexico, 1863. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, you can't see that, right? No, probably not. Okay. Um, if you ever have a chance to pick up the book, there's some panels where um, it's working um, vertically, right? Rather than sort of the left to right orientation of, of most, um, um, conventions of printing. So what I, what I was trying to do is try to actually read it, not vertically, because it would make sense, quote unquote, but I was trying to read it horizontally so that none of these uh, words or letters or syllables constitute any kind of language at all. So that like my vocalizing it doesn't already merge with a kind of system of language or a language that's bounded by nation state. So, I mean, that's not necessarily clear from what I read. So I just wanted to give you a little sense of uh, what I'm up to there. Pity doves, silicate, the great lakes, Silt, slit, syllabaries. Production bin and aspen grove. Persons to appear, persons who made debris architecture. If a species cannot find a sonic niche of its own, it will not survive. Thank you. I wanted to keep it short so we can open it up. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. This was amazing. And I'm so, yeah, but it was perhaps, um, uh, a very interesting accident or event with this um, Zoom. Yeah, I, I really hope that others <laughs> felt that an opportunity as well. <laughs> now there's somebody at the door. <laughs> I would like to ask um, if um, Christina or Mampasa would have any or Myung, when she comes back, have any questions or thoughts or, yeah, if you'd like to bring anything. Back. I would be curious to hear questions from the audience. Uh, um, we can, yeah, we can also want to. I mean, I don't have anything immediate, but I, yeah, in, in time. 
Yeah, in time. And there's a lot to digest. Um, um, I mean, that, yeah. Okay. Perhaps um, if, are there any questions from the, from the room? <laughs> Otherwise, we could go back to some of these questions. How does form arise? Maybe for all three of you, how does form arise? And I appreciated what Myung said about praxis and the kind of continuity of it. Um, of as it, or like to think of unlearning as a praxis perhaps paired with resistance, um, that um, is interminable, let's say. Um, <laughs> but I would, yeah, I would love to hear from you, from, from who, if you'd like to, you can use the hand signal in the reactions. Uh, uh, Melissa, yes, <laughs> you have a hand up. Yeah, like I'm <laughs> volunteer that uh, you know goes to the front to be shifted. so. Yeah, so uh, um, yeah, I, I I actually I really so so first you know this is also this language of the you know that the, uh, actually what you said it was an accident but we know that accidents are not just accidents so I think it, it was really great in a way to experience this moment of, you know, how to get back into contact, you know? And then we actually, uh, when you mentioned uh, also in your, in your reading, but also in your speech, so this moment in your talk or your, in your intervention now, uh, mm, this moment of a language that, that actually, when we talk about English, which is, you know, I'm also not a native speaker, so I also am terrorized, you know, all the time, actually to use a language which, which brings so many, you know, opportunities at the other hand and opens also somehow, not just uh, do, but in my, in my, you know, in my mind. So yeah. around meaning, maybe novel formulations and novel thinking in my head through this, complication that comes with the language. But then I really appreciated this moment in reading your poetry when we actually couldn't read anymore. There was no language anymore. It was just, so I'm just bringing this into connection with uh -huh. this possibility for you to connect with us through, uh, you know, this com compu computer language actually, or program language that actually we are all not uh, generally and like not connected with this. We are in a con continuous learning about this, but we are actually also alienated from this. Is also makes us, um, yeah, we are, we're all alienated at the same time. So I just wanted to say this, I, I, I found this moment of, of, of no language a great moment in this, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I absolutely agree with that. And I would love to hear from others about how, like what did it actually feel like when we were having quote unquote difficulty? Was it difficulty? Did you experience it as something else? Um, the unknown, um, the unknowable, I think that was a word that uh, perhaps uh, um, was uh, used earlier and I think, uh, um, um, Tansa, you also used the word like, um, uh, yes, unknowability or, or fossilized. And I was th thinking about uh, and using a word like necrotized uh, for a reason, because partly what is necrotized is our expectations of competence. Like I was quote unquote incompetent. And then partly our training is like, like look for this, do that like problem solving which has been really interesting for me because how can you in some sense transpose incompetence to a kind of new right new approach to um knowing so this is something that i wanted to maybe uh ask some of you to share about how you was it intolerable were you ashamed for me 
did you want to get off Zoom? Uh, did you want to go on to the next part of your day? You know what I mean? Like the idea of uh, competence, incompetence, agility, fluency, these all have to do with, um, again, whether it's in one uh, field or another, like we're talking about learner, unlearning, we're in a, in a institution, right, of higher learning, all of you are or were or, or will be. Okay, so the idea of fluency competence. Also, I think for me, and I would love to hear from um, you know everyone, uh, and especially my fellow readers about how you think about fluency competence and what that has to do with like rights. Who gets to speak? Um, how often do we hear like uh, like if somebody like how do you track the foreign or the native? You know, just by even one accent, like right? it's very quick. You have an accent, you belong. So, I mean, there are, I think, a lot of implications for citizenship, what constitutes intelligibility, who recognizes you as a, a, a intelligible, right, a subject with rights and privileges to belong. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, but I, I, I do want to, I am curious about what, I, I'm, first of all, I'm curious that no one left, right? So let me, let me just, and, and thank you. Uh, I've been thinking about these kind of issues about um, why is competence, right? I mean, unlearning imperialism, like competence is one of the best uh, measures, if you will, right? of, of the like, imperialist objectives and goals to make self same and transparency. This is quite alarming you now. <laughs> All right, I mean, let me, I would love to hear from my fellow readers, especially, and those of you in the seminar, uh, what I said about form, I think that would be also a, a kind of a juicy conversation. Okay. Yes, please. Um, I, yeah, I think I experienced it as sort of a, a moment of suspension, yeah. um, and of like relinquishing or like, or letting go of expecting something to happen, which um, I always welcome. Um, but um, I think you made some like some great points around you know competency and fluency being utilized or like weaponized um, yes. those ends um, yep. and in many ways how that you know sort of opens up failure um, yep. as perhaps maybe you know something that's fruitful or, or, or delay right or arrested delay or, or something along those uh, terms but I think for me um, when I think of unlearning or when I was approaching like just writing something for this or sharing some readings for this um, I was just thinking about how there is this sort of like stasis that's associated with it that completely removes um, removes the the agency or the active nature of the process, um, and I think there is this way in which it's it's considered to be a destination that one arrives at, um, and I think with that sense of finality, I think some people do do wear that with this sort of um, this self-satisfaction of like having unlearned something or having unlearned sort of like these, like for example, systematic biases or whatever the kind of like language of the day is used um, to, to describe these, these sort of matrices of power. Um, but I think what can happen is sometimes when you are surrounded by people who very much embody or, or, or in spaces that embody that sense of finality, that sense of um, finitude, I think what can happen is, um, you, you're really struck by how it fossilizes the process and how it kind of like enshrines it, almost entombs it. Um, and I think that's quite dangerous in many ways because it it's, I think it's, it's the source of so many of these kind of savior complexes that are always um, swallowing up people and swallowing up movements and, and these impulses that we kind of have to guard against, um, because in many ways it is we we all know we should be seen as a transformative process that has no sort of like end, right? It has no uh, peak, and I think that's what sometimes uh, it can can get lost in all the sort of language and rhetoric around unlearning. And I think also just in terms of unlearning as a communal activity as well as something that I think there is this other way in which it's individualized or perhaps you know it becomes a subculture of its own, which I think is also another risk. Um, and it and it kind of loses its its expansive nature of of, of tying it to you know well, who who and what planted those seeds in you, right? And where are you going to take those seeds, right? And where will they flourish? And I think that's that's a question that I ask myself all the time when I feel like I'm. I'm perhaps in a space or in a room or in a position where 
you know, there is this sort of, I mean, I, I would say it is a form of smugness. Um, there is this kind of smug attitude of, you know, we, we have unlearned all these um, dynamics and we are now sort of like the anointed ones. Um, and in, in, in many ways that does, that does sort of like infect certain sort of like activists or artistic spaces. Um, and I think it, in many ways I'm grappling with that um, in my own work, but also again, I mean, I'm not a fan of, like I said, you know, of self-flagellation. I think there is, there is um, a time and a place for that, but in the sense of like learning should be collaborative, unlearning should be collaborative. And also it should also, it should be, it should be joyous. I think there's also this this denial of its pleasures, which is something I want to return to. Yes, absolutely. Um, maybe I can have a like, brief uh, response and then also ask, you know, pass it to more questions. Um, I, I, the question of like form and these kind of questions that you just brought up about, um, I guess, um, about the kind of texture of, of speech was kind of one of the things I was thinking about when I wrote um, this uh, recent piece, which is called like Telegraphy of Morning, which I was, um, I, I guess I've been thinking about this on a much more, per well, um, I mean, on a, very personal level. So I, I think I, you know, have also some kind of building blocks to put together or to, to kind of like think through, but I, um, you know, my relationship to form is really through like resistance in the sense of, um, I feel <laughs> very resistant. Um, and, and there's a kind of, uh, emotional ambivalence that goes on in like my attempts to formalize the ways that I speak. Um, so, I mean, I was trying to think about this through like specifically voices, like the voice of my parents, um, mm -hmm. uh, which are, you know, like now only memory, uh, on, for one of them, only a memory. Um, and, you know, especially the kind of like accents and the kind of qualities of, um, of like learning that they're attached to. So like my attempt in my poetry is often to kind of like I'm realizing this lately, like it's often to like completely cover over and completely hide um, any kind of like non-fluency or non-politeness in the way that I speak. And I have, you know, like my, my relationship to language and learning is very much one of like extreme embarrassment, even though I know that like I present and I try to present as being like extremely fluent um, in the way that I like, engage with intellectual um you know concepts so i i'm also thinking just of like my dad he was a very like aggressively autodidactic person you know sometimes i would think about like the way that he talked you know as being like more somehow through the masculine and somehow through like this kind of like aggressiveness and there's like lots of complications around that but like also specifically through his accent um where um which I was kind of always trying to hide, but also the aggressiveness persists in like my turning of my own like shame into kind of like armor. <laughs> um, so that was kind of one of the things I was trying to think about is like the ways that like um, shame over not being proper becomes yeah. like a kind of armor. Um, and like, I really amp up <laughs> my own attempts to like, appear intellectual so I mean that's another like thing that I'm just thinking about at the moment but I also um yeah I mean the question of how that relates to rights is like also one that like I would need to kind of like elaborate in a more fully politicized um yeah. way um and uh and I guess on the other but I think this relates to form in the sense of like a kind of formal resistance, like a resistance against the kind of embarrassment um, that I that also kind of like provides part of its interest for me. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I also wanted to engage with like the what Montaza, Montaza was saying about like the another aspect of that armor can be like the wearing of something as a brand or the wearing of something as like a, an achieved um stance <laughs> and like i i feel like 
what I was trying to speak to a little bit in, with the Brecht quote, but like maybe also be critical of the Brechtian stance um, is just like this, um, this like notion of what one's investment is in, uh, in that kind of um, uh, pro pro proclamation of the truth or like what, what kind of investment in the truth. Um, so like learning as a relationship to the truth um, do you have an, what kind of investment in um, yeah, proclaiming the truth does one have or like what are the hypocrisies around that, I guess? Um, yeah, sorry, I feel like I'm <laughs> failing competence, but I <laughs> hope that that made kind of uh, a little bit of sense. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions. So I, shall we take both of them or one at a time? Maybe they're comments, I don't know. Um, okay, Farnoosh and then Boudot. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so yes, I just, uh, just a second, I will also open my camera. Okay. So I just wanted to have the kind of reflection on the moment that uh, the Zoom meeting was paused for a second and to this kind of relation to this all learning. I think that was really nice because <laughs> uh, for me, I was struggling for some moments like what is going on if I'm missing something, if I cannot hear something and um, I think that was the moment that really uh, this this lack of presence somehow shows you that you are here, you know, and mm -hmm. you are waiting for something to happen. That and that was quite amazing when you think about it because we are all the time here, but yeah. I don't know if we are noticing that, you know, we're like here and listening, and yeah, sometimes times just goes by and we don't notice, but this lack of presence or lack of um, continuing something was just the moment that gathered all the information again on the point. So yeah, I just wanted to say that that was a different kind of experience for me. Can I just like a quick um, response to what Farnoosh just said? Because I think what um, you're describing is a really um, productive way that we can think about how we're so indoctrinated thinking about time as uninterrupted or linear or progressive or chronological, right? So I think uh, in my work, uh, again, as a poet uh, or, or like things I make with language are in, in fact very much in the service of how to re I don't know, recalibrate these expectations about um, uninterrupted time, progressive time, the linear flow of time. Right? And that there are many possible uh, ways to imagine and participate in time. So here I'm very interested in these linear expectations, progressive chronological, so forth and so on, and their implications for how we think history. So I, I love that, that, that notion that the, the, the kind of the not having that instant connection meant that you could actually multiply time or pluralize time and have an experience of being present. So thank you for that, yeah. And then maybe Budo and then Lizzie, and then I also have a question in the chat. Um, okay, thank you, first of all, thank you very much. That was really amazing. I just want, I have a, First of all, I want to just comment like very quickly on the topic of incompetence because I, I'm a migrant here and I never kind of, I am thinking a lot about language like constantly, but I never think about it in this. I, I always try actually to use English because I feel like it, it, it kind of at least makes less this incompetence aspect because German is my third language and I feel like so unequal speaking to a first like someone's mother tongue is German and mine is like the one I learned when I was 25 and then I feel this like huge actually gap and I feel always this sense of in being incompetent and 
I don't know. It's also like it's a struggle that I go through. But what I do actually is I try to avoid speaking German. And I think I need <laughs> to think about that. <laughs> but uh, speaking of competence and incompetence, I just have a question actually um, to all of the guests actually today. Uh, because talking, talking about unlearning um, and like listening to all of you, I think using and also like the what what you've brought up about the, the limits of language and the standardization standard standards of language and being in these norms and then trying to kind of break free from them and you feel you feel this in poetry you feel that poetry actually speaks also to your senses so it's it it is one way to be free of it but i wanted to actually, I mean, I think using language in this way, it just kind of speaks to something more when you do, when you recite poetry. But my question is why new work and like thinking about this and learning. And then you actually have these moments of creative writing, but how do you revisit your work? So how do you actually shape it? Or I don't know if I'm using the right words, but while thinking of unlearning, how do you actually edit your poetry or I don't know if I'm clear. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Christina or Tansa, do you want to speak to that? I think for me, it's, it's a process of, um, it's always a process of return, but um, returning to poems that may have been written, you know, years before, or perhaps uh, poems that were written a day before. But I think it's approaching with this like fresh eye each time for what it's trying to convey to me before anyone else. Um, and I, what I'm trying to understand through it, because usually for me, that's how I approach poetry. It's, it's a way for me to understand um, what I'm and work through um, things, but to do so in a way that prioritizes my own gaze before any sort of like readership or, or you know, um, supposed audience. Um, I think in terms of, this is where for me, this question ties in with form because um, the form itself um, is a negotiation and it's never something that I sort of like, rarely I walk into, you know, knowing what the form is going to be. Um, I think the form it, itself, it's sort of like scaffolded um, by the essence of the poem and it works backwards from that. Um, and I think I'm open to failure in that way because it's a portal of surprise for me um, in terms of poetry. But um, I think when it comes to unlearning and how that relates to like the individual poem or sort of like the poet's role, it's more so trying to push past that sort of, that sometimes debilitating fear of getting something wrong and by wrong, I mean, that's such a, and, and that's such a sort of embedded fear in how we kind of approach gaps in our knowledge or perhaps gaps in empathy. There is this sort of overwhelming fear of um, saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, making the wrong turn. And I think that fear that we live with every day absolutely reveals itself in our poetry. I think there's no way to avoid it in your own poetry. And I think that's, for me, it's understanding that that's something I have to push past, not just in my personal life, but also in my actual poetry. And then sometimes what happens when I return to certain poems, I can see exactly where that fear has wormed its way in. And that's a way of editing to kind of try and uproot it, um, which is a constant process. And it's, it's, it's a way to approach, I, I would say for me personally, it's a way to approach life as well as how to approach my own poetics. Um, but yeah, it's, it's again, it's, it's about that sort of excavation of fear of throwing it up against the light and seeing why it's there why it's present and um, why it's um so rooted within this poem um, and what it's evading and trying to find a way to work through that and that's how i i mean that for me is the essence of editing yeah. it's so interesting because i feel like i should take away from your book because i feel like i I do the opposite like I think I am more intuitive in the first round of writing and then an editing process usually involves this kind of like interiorization of like 
my audience or like who I expect might read it and like the kind of expectations of those yeah of those others so um I I sometimes yeah like change change um things I have written out of probably a sense of um uh fear of appearing yeah maybe like um like embarrassing or something um so I I think that um yeah that's I don't know it's something that I probably will think about now like what what kind of order does that um process of interiorization like happen in or something or like how could that be mm-hmm. upset a little um that's yeah a cool series of thoughts um yeah so um are there any other comments to this or shall we hear lizzie lizzie hi um yeah with the long with the moment of suspense um i i thought it was a case of um not being able to find find what to read and what to continue reading um and i i didn't feel um hurried or concerned i sort of started imagining what was happening behind the scenes like i imagined that roseanne might be sending a message and like checking um but um yeah maybe that sort of connects to a question of form and showing one's workings or like the sort of untraceability of process sometimes um but then i was i was yeah i also would be interested to hear if christina wanted to talk about the workshop and and how the workshop um either was planned or took place and and what relationship that had to architecture. Um, And then the other thing I was thinking of about in relation to speed and also in relation to texture um, and agency was like the speed of thought and when you're thinking or have more than one language in your head at a time and this sort of um, untranslatability of of a speed of thought and I was recently reading about like thought without an image and reading about Arta and like trying to understand what this meant in relation to what an object is in art connected to or not connected to sense of self and identity um but um yeah and then texture and like agency whether there is something in what texture allows or like texture has a different way of reading that that has not what not one surface but um if anything ever has one surface but like has depths and layers and ways around Thank you. Um, are there any, Montasso or Myung or Christina, would you like to respond to this? Um, I think maybe the best way for me mm-hmm. to respond um, uh, mm-hmm. to this particular uh, set mm-hmm. of uh, uh, comments, L- Lizzie, right? Uh, love the phrase, untraceability of the speed of thought. And there's a lot to uh, sort of work with with that sense of, um, again, because I think so much of what language is quote unquote harnessed for, it's like this kind of instant of knowing or instant uh, of knowledge making, an instant of knowledge production. But what if there were in fact these possible retexturing of that expectation? So that it's not that instant for instant or equivalence for equivalence, the way that I think, you know, translation is in fact supposed to work by equivalence. Um, but the kind of the, the slightly askew, right? The uh, depths and layers, I mean, these are words that you were using, so I'm just um, um, you, saying them back to you because I think they're beautiful. Depths and layers are kind of weaving and unweaving before something becomes completely scrutable, right? Or the word that I've been using, completely intelligible. Um, 
I am, I am dying to know how those of you who are doing more of the architecture aspect of this, how, how do you find um, this, uh, what uh, Roseanne was uh, saying earlier about the architecture of poetry and uh, poetry of architecture, because some of uh, Lizzie's comments, right? What does it mean to have like an untranslability of the speed of thought? How, we, how do we think we texture depths and layers and traces? Um, I think those all have to do with, you know, the uh, archi architecture of poetry and maybe the poetry of architecture, but I would love to hear more about that. So thank you for, for those contributions. Christina, anybody? Otherwise, we, maybe, the, I don't know, yeah, are there any comments from the students about these issues in relation to, to your writing or your thoughts about architecture and form? Or, yeah, I, I, I would yeah. also yeah. encourage that because I, I couldn't explain a little bit about the workshop, but maybe that would also be something people who were in it can, can fill yeah. in a bit. Because, yeah. Um, it, you know, the, the kind of basic premise was to, to use this kind of, um, yeah, some kind of poetics or some kind of like poetic approach to, um, to think about this script that you've all been writing. And so, um, I was trying to conceive of a, a way of bringing in some kind of methods from the poetry that I have like read and, um, uh, and consumed, you know, um, documentary poetry in order to like work out some methods of like encountering objects and, um, and images and, and also pieces of language in like a, a, a way that um, reflect, yeah, I don't know, reflect something of a kind of, um, of a document or a, a history, but like also um, uh, shapes it in a new way or has a kind of selectivity in relation to it, um, selectively exaggerates perhaps. So maybe I'm just um, currently thinking through all this kind of Brechtian language, but um, uh, that was part of what I wanted to kind of introduce this kind of like um, selective exaggeration or um, selectivity, um, but maybe some of the, the the workshop participants can talk to that. If they want, <laughs> if they want. <laughs> yeah, I think. Okay. I think yeah. It was it was very interesting in the workshop to like to actually like take visual images and then think of how you know let your think of how to use language in relation to that because especially like as architects we i mean our training is always kind of directed towards making drawings making form making but not so much uh, we don't write so much, I mean, <laughs> in the practice of the university of how you design, actually how they teach you to design. Uh, and I mean, it's really, it's really important to also think, yeah, because also, you know, I think in relation to also architecture, the, all of what we do, all of these typologies all are also standards and norms and all of the form and how you try to fit the building into the context. It's all really embedded also. And you have all these books with the norms and the standards. And yeah, to unlearn that, to, un to think of that also, I don't know, it, it just, it requires a lot of uprooting <laughs> of the same thing as with language of all these also visual images that we have. And then it's really good, I think, to just take these visual images and then to try to write and then revisit your writing and then to see how you're thinking and maybe, yeah, how you can change that. Yeah, thanks. That's really a great reflection. And Farnoosh? Yes, I just wanted to say that I, I don't know if I see architecture as a language or I see architecture as a poem, you know. Uh, I'm still struggling with this 
uh, with this concept that if architecture is a language, so um, it's 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 more it's harder, let's say. <laughs> but if it's a poem, it can be really subjective to to the people. In that case, I think it's a language. And what we did in Christina's uh, workshop, we had this kind of uh, training to um, write a story. One is real and the other is fake. And I think uh, sometimes we are doing we are doing it in the architecture, you know? Sometimes we are faking something and you can easily see that, that faking and sometimes you can see the reality. And sometimes it's hard to tell, you know, <laughs> we had this, like, we had this uh, struggling, which one is real and which one is fake. So yeah, in this case, I can somehow relate architecture to this language and all these dilemmas that it has at the moment, at least for me. Thanks, Anish. And Patty? And I think just to say, sorry, because we're going slightly over time, I think we should wrap up soon because we've been here for a long time and I don't want to, um, I don't want people to be too exhausted, but maybe if there are a couple more comments, if that's okay with Montata, Christina and Mion, then. Is that okay for, yeah, if we, maybe just a couple of minutes, is that okay with you? Okay. Um, Patty? Yes. Yeah, I will in in somehow uh, uh, try to uh, like Boudou said uh, that we have all these uh, pre-established uh, rules and things that architects have to deal with wh while they are designing. Uh, even even though we have them, it's something that I think it's the poetic part of architecture is that for each architect, the circumstances are given the same. The place is the same, the, the, the rules are the same, the laws are the same, but two different architects will draw two different buildings for that place and three different architects will, will draw three different buildings for that place. And that is how in some way architecture can be also poetic because to uh, one one um, uh, one will write a poem and uh, about a window and then the other the other one will write a completely different poem about that that same window you know we are uh, I feel that and we we are also lying at all times and we are trying to translate into this this is a very this is very interesting for me how we are all all the time trying to translate to our own uh, abilities this 3d world into a 2d dimension and how this is also somehow the magic of it and somehow all the work that we have to do is this, is to make something understandable in 2D that actually is real world and will be even more than 3D because then there is time and then there is people's lives and then there is the social and then there is the political that also is very, is interacting with architecture all time. And I think that's where we find the poetics of it. I don't know because every circumstance creates different projects and just like every circumstance creates different poems. That's beautiful. <laughs> and and there is, um, so just, I think this, these will be the last two comments or questions, if that's okay with everyone. So uh, Peter and Anastasia, maybe we can do both together. Thank you, Patty. Do you want to go first? Sorry? Oh, uh, Peter. yes. It, it, this is okay. Peter. Am I on? Mm -hmm. Now you're on. Now you're on. Okay. Okay, great. Wonderful. Oh, now you went. I'm, I'm a now person who's interested in. I'm sorry? You're muted for a moment. I don't know. <laughs> it flips between okay. the muted numbers. Can, can, can you hear me now? 
Yeah, now it's fine. Okay. <laughs> I understand completely technical challenges. I understand communication challenges. As a person who's living in a third country uh, in my life, as, as a child, I was a French American. I was never quite at home in either culture. I always felt like an outsider and now I'm living in Austria. So I'm, I'm in a third culture. So I, I, I'm used to sounding like an idiot sometimes and, and being misunderstood uh, and, and various situations technologically and the like. So I, I have complete compassion for, for those kind of circumstances like that. My question is actually more uh, actually as a person who represents the arts, uh, I'm actually very interested in the idea of, of other forms of knowledge, of nonverbal forms of knowledge, visual forms of knowledge. I, I particularly think poetry gives us incredible forms of knowledge. I'm very suspicious, I, I'm sorry to say this to an academic group, but I'm very suspicious of a lot of academic thinking. I'm very suspicious of the fact that we're often speaking in the English language, the language of imperialist, or that we often use the language of French post-structuralists to interpret the language, uh, to, to criticize that language since the French post-structuralist as a French person as well, as a, as a French American uh, and, and very well versed in those things, I'm, I'm suspicious that the French post-structuralists were also imperialist as well. And, and I'm also interested in non-Western non ways of thinking. How can we incorporate more of those kinds of thinking into what we're doing rather than always using English, Western thinking, academic thinking, uh, poetry to me seems like an incredible way to to really transcend those things. The visual arts seem like an incredible way to transcend those things. Uh, uh, nature, uh, I think there's so much more we have to add to the conversation. And since so many people are coming from so many different countries and so many different lands, I'm really, really curious what else is missing? What else is in our conversation? Or is that conversation framed by an imperialist framework right from the get-go? So we're all subject to that. So we always have to respond is imperialism and anti-imperialism, but what about pre-imperialism or post-imperialism in that? So, okay, those are my comments. Thank you. Yeah, maybe Anastasia, if you have also a quick comment and then we can hear finally from the I have, I'm trying to be very quick. I'm more to uh, what the party said about the poetic of architecture. For us, we don't use language in our professional practice. We use an English language to describe our project, but it's a document, so it's, it's something different. But if we are all talking about our real work, so we don't use words, we use windows, we use columns, we use pergolas, we use walls, walls etc, etc. We use materials and we use our own experience that we have through our study, uh, personal life, etc, etc. Because we have not only, as Boudour said, a rules, we have only, we have also a lot of knowledge about light, materials, culture, how it works together. Uh, and part is uh, right because each architect will make a different project. It's, it couldn't be the same like in literature. If we put the same uh, topic, we became thousand different uh, texts or thousand different poems. But uh, in my home academy, uh, we don't say a poetry of, or a poesy of architect. We say the architecture is a frozen music. We compare this with music. For us, architecture is music. From Goethe, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's more classical way to see uh, the architecture, but it could work in, in some way. You can see the rhythm, you can see the, how it's going slower or not. So we can really feel it more like a music. 
Thank you, Anastasia. And just so just to um, I would like I would love to hear if there are any final comments from from our guests tonight. Um, otherwise, yeah, are there any final comments? Um, yeah, I was just wanted to sort of like speak to what Peter said, um, yeah. but also um, I think what uh, Benjamin asked in the chat. I think mm. I was thinking about both of these things um, at the same time. Um, I think in like this sort of like urgency of like unlearning can sometimes be exacerbated by like these forms of political solutionism that or like enforced um, pragmatism that can trickle into like your our daily social relations. Because like when I think of you know, you mentioned these all these other forms of knowledge. Um, I'm thinking of like friendships and relationships as like forms and gatherings and spaces of knowledge and that kind of, and relation is like the ultimate field of unlearning. Um, and sort of like sometimes the urge to solve or to kind of avoid sitting with um, discomfort or like the incoherence of, of grief or, or even just the nature or the practice of um, like thinking with imperialists, even as you think against them, um, and even when you, when you mentioned like a non-Western context, it's like um, my primary sort of introduction to poetry was through um, Arabic poetry and arguably that is an imperial language. So it's, it's, it's sometimes there are these inherent contradictions and I think there can be something, there can be something quite um, regenerative about like of, of just like sitting with them. Um, and sometimes urgency can be, um, it can be powerful in the sense of like, you know, just having that sort of Fanonian impulse to, to like discover one's mission and fulfill it or betray it, which can be interpreted as like um, a search for, for, for like upturning or like this immediacy um, that is like felt quite deeply in the body, um, which can sometimes, I think sometimes that can be interpreted in ways that can be often to our detriment or even used against us. Um, I'm thinking of uh, the, the writer Tony Cade Bambara, you know, saying, uh, not all speed is movement. Um, and I tr really try to think with what that means, right? And maybe there is this kind of, uh, violence to like an urgency that evacuates or belittles um, practices of mourning, um, of stillness, of slowness, um, and, and one that just comes across as incredibly serious and, and sort of like um, denies play or wonder um, that is left in unlearning. Um, I'm still trying to work this out uh, for myself in many ways because there is times when you just want to like read and you know join a study group and like highlight all these passages and whatnot and just like think deeply and there's times when you just want to like smash it up really and it's it's that tension um, and I think I try to work through that in my poems um, and maybe it's useful to think think of unlearning as a kind of like temporal contradiction so it's outside of time which means like it's always on time. So maybe we just have to be ready. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks. Amazing. Um, I I I I have a multitude of thoughts <laughs> and a, an array of thoughts, but I don't have a very good formulation of them right now. So I think my final comment would just be like, thank you so much to everyone for like really beautiful readings and for inviting me to come. Um, yeah, I like feel like I um, it's like yeah, been really great to to hear his readings and and have all these thoughts from everyone um, who came. So. I'll just say briefly um, to Anastasia's question. Uh, I think that's, uh, and this is going to be a little bit of, of, of a devilish comment on my part, but one of the things I really do uh, want to invite all of us to think about is how then does language or poetry, perhaps in particular, become a kind of uh, musical figure? also, rather than there's a separation between what we might call music and what we might call poetry. Because I'm very, very interested in how the sonic value of language, not language as a communicative tool or an instrument, but language as a kind of live, kinetic, physiological force works in the imagination and in culture and in aesthetics to become a kind of uh, adjacent figure to music. And similarly, I think um, Peter's comment about 
the absence of certain things, it's not so much that they're absent, but that by calling to them, by beckoning to them, um, rather than saying, why are these things excluded? But what happens when they're called in? So it's that sense of openness. And um, this, I, I love the phrases, pleasure, joy, wonder, uh, Matamza, because I think that's what it takes. This is what I mean by praxis. It's a praxis of paying attention right, to those things that would always be somehow in, on the wings of things or the phrase of things. And uh, I, I do wanna echo Christina and say, Roseanne, um, thank you so much for uh, having us, uh, allowing us to have this conversation. And thanks to all of you who participated. And uh, perhaps you could give us a little update once you've um, like met with the seminar participants again and maybe giving us a sense of uh, how they're carrying forward the conversation between um, you know, poetics of learning and architecture practice and all of that. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'm, yeah, I'm really, um, incredibly, I feel like this has been incredibly um, enriching. And yeah, I also really appreciate all of your contributions. And I think we all do. I can speak on behalf of Melissa and Philip as well. And um, um, yeah, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for coming. And I hope that we can continue this conversation. Um, and yes, I will send an update. and. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.